So Peter, another follow-up is, you know, earlier you mentioned that there might be some risk factors for why someone might get screened for bone health earlier. So kind of what should people be aware of if they're thinking about if they're maybe at risk and what are some of those red flags they should look out for? Uh, so, you know, it sounds cliche, but family history matters. Uh, and this is actually not something I appreciated until we were getting ready to do this podcast. I didn't realize genetics accounted for up to 50% of bone health. So having either parent that's had a history of a hip fracture, that's a huge red flag. Um, there are other things we want to care about, right? So we want to look at fractures related to mild or moderate trauma. So you look at somebody who's had a fall from standing height or less, that's, you know, someone who's fallen from such a low height and still had a fracture, that's a huge problem. Another thing we look at is in female athletes. And this is really common actually in female endurance athletes, especially runners, um, where weight is such an important part of the sport, right? You know, it's, uh, you're, you're punished a lot uh, in terms of performance for extra weight. Same is true in cycling, not as true in swimming. So when you look at high-end uh, female endurance athletes, we care a lot about you know poor nutritional state, which can lead to a very low BMI, low body fat percent, and eventually estrogen deficiency. So these interrelated conditions of the sort of low bone health, hormone dysfunction, and, and low BMI are kind of collectively known as the female athlete triad. So that's another big risk factor. Low BMI in general, so anything below about 18 or 19. And then the other thing we look at is, uh, is people who have had high exposure to drugs that affect bone metabolism. And I think the most common of these that we see is corticosteroids. Now, that's not always systemic corticosteroids. You know, it's not always people that have had to take lots of steroids for illness. It can also be inhaled corticosteroids. And we see this actually in a number of patients who had significant asthma as children and used a lot of inhaled corticosteroids. So those are... That's not an exhaustive list, but that's a pretty good list to sort of get you thinking about who is at high risk here. Yeah. And you, you mentioned it a little bit at the end there, and we did receive a lot of questions on it, which are around the various drugs that may impair bone deposition. So, um, anything more you want to say, I know you mentioned a few of them there, but anything you want to double click on? I, I think the last big risk factor we look for, and I, we just saw a patient recently who didn't have any other risk factors except for the fact that they have a 20 pack year smoke history that is more than 15 years old. So you barely think of this person as a former smoker because they've been so long without smoking, but you know, they did smoke for 20 years prior to quitting. Um, and that is an independent risk factor for low uh, BMD, which in this case, uh, this patient had very low BMD. Uh, we had to actually refer them to an endocrinologist. Do you see anything with patients? Cause you know, we know that BMD, the eight to 20 is such a big age range. And if you have someone who is smoking kind of in that age range while bone mineral density is really going up, do you see it become kind of even worse? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Nick. So we, uh, I didn't know this until, again, we got thinking about this study, uh, but there, there are actually data looking at <clears throat> never smokers, early smokers, and late smokers. Early smokers were defined as people who started smoking before the age of 16 and late smokers. Well, it's hard to believe late is considered after 16. Um, but the early smokers were far more impacted. So when you look at these people later in life, the never smokers, not surprisingly, had the best bone density. The early smokers had the worst and the late smokers were in the middle. Um, I don't know the stats about teenage smoking today. I, I kind of assumed it was on the decline, but, um, you know, this would certainly be yet another, um, reason to avoid smoking at a young age, even if, you know, that person goes on to stop at the age of 20. Um, and even if their risk of lung cancer becomes relatively moot by the time they're, you know, 50, they may still pay a price for that with bone mineral density throughout their entire life. Yeah. And on the topic of what you talked about a second ago, we also did receive a lot of questions around various drugs that could impair bone deposition. You mentioned a few of them earlier, but is there anything you want to double click on there? So again, you know, corticosteroids, I, I think have to be considered the first and most important one of these drugs you want to be considered about. And, and, and they, 
you know, I, I think they, they do a couple of things, right? So they kind of impair the mineralization of bone by favoring bone reabsorption during the early phase. And then they kind of inhibit calcium absorption in the gut that this, this area comes up, this, this, that comes up over and over again, right? Anything that impairs calcium absorption is going to be problematic. And it, and it really doesn't need to be mega doses of steroids. Um, people who are familiar with long-term use of steroids might recognize that a, a dose of prednisone of five milligrams a day is not enormous. Um, you know, a prednisone dose of five milligrams a day is, I mean, I think it's actually still a kind of big dose because it's about the physiologic equivalent of how much hydrocort, you know, how much cortisol a person makes. Um, but nevertheless, you know, that amount is associated with significant reductions in bone mineral density and an increased risk fracture within as little as three to six months of initiation. Again, just as we saw in the figure that showed how women are primarily losing trabecular bone. It's, it's the same here with, with, with cortisol. So, um, that doesn't mean you should never take uh, corticosteroids. There are lots of conditions where corticosteroids are going to save your life. It means you have to be aware of these things and you're going to have to work a lot harder to counter their effects. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those things. Um, another class of drugs that I get asked about a lot is proton pump inhibitors, PPIs. And, you know, I, I would say the data here are less clear. So there are studies that have assessed the relationship between PPIs, and they do show an increase in osteoporotic fracture. Um, the most likely mechanism suggested is, again, intestinal calcium absorption. So anything that interrupts that, which then goes on to interrupt osteoclast formation and bone remodeling. But I, but I want to be clear that this is not nearly as well understood as the case is for corticosteroids. So there, there are a number of observational studies that show an increase in the risk of fracture. But, you know, then we look at large meta-analyses that don't find a, 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 statistical, a statistically significant uh, decline in BMD with PPI use. Um, so again, I think you just have to be smart about this, right? Um, there are lots of reasons we're going to put patients on PPIs. If a patient has significant reflux that is not amenable to other treatments, we're going to put them on a PPI. If a patient has Barrett's esophagus, we're putting them on a PPI. It's non-negotiable, right? So it just means that we have to be thoughtful about, is the drug really indicated? And if it is, what else can we do to reduce the risk down the line? I think the final class of drugs that... Um, tend to have a similar association, although probably from a different mechanism, are some of the anti-epileptic drugs. Um, and, and one in particular, which is phenytoin, so a super common uh, anti-seizure drug. Here, I think the mechanism might have more to do with um, like the liver inducing an enzyme called cytochrome P450 that leads to increased catabolism of vitamin D. And that, of course, you may recall, will lead to decreased uh, absorption of calcium in the gut. I don't know if anybody's done a study, but it seems to me that a no-brainer study would be taking patients on phenytoin and supplementing them with lots of vitamin D to see if you can overcome that. But again, um, you know, phenytoin is a common drug within the world of anti-seizure meds, but in the big picture, nowhere near as common as corticosteroids and proton pump inhibitors. So I think where we're going to go next is starting to look at what people can do to improve their bone health. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights. You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment 
to a healthier future. Thank you.